Great, we're live. Thanks everybody for joining us at our great Bronx Council of Environmental Quality tradition. And that's our water mini conference. This is, I hope you all agree that we couldn't find a better spot for this event. First of all, it's outside, it's beautiful, but you're seeing the beauty of the Harlem River and Roberto Clemente State Park. Um, this is a real jewel of the New York State Office of Parks. And I want to thank the Office of Parks, Francis Rodriguez, Leslie Wright, and all the staff that have made this happen. In addition, we're sponsored today by a grant from Con Edison, so we thank them for the turnout and this wonderful food. Now, our, our organization, Bronx Council for Environmental Quality, has put a lot of work into event planning today. We have a great program where you've got to see the maps of the original Greenway from 1993, and we're here as we near the 50th anniversary of the 1993 plan to really take stock. But we chose this site today because the topic for today's panel or conference is greenways, waterways, and waterfronts. Because we really believe we've reached a new era in building greenways. There's a ton of new news you're going to find about, new resources from the federal government, new commitments from the City of New York for resiliency planning, new capital projects right here in the Bronx that are bringing agencies together for resiliency projects that are also greenways. So we have everything here. We have waterways, we have waterfronts, and we have everything. We have a greenway right here in this park, but what we're here to do is talk about the unbuilt greenways north and south of this park so it's a great occasion and a beautiful site for talking about the future of greenways. So uh, we have a great panel and we're going to have four questions. Our format is really to have three questions in which there's going to be first responses from decision makers from the city of New York and we'll introduce our panelists in a minute. And then we're going to have a short dialogue with members of Bronx Council of Environmental Quality. And then there's going to be questions from you and from, is anyone on Facebook could help me find questions from the chat. Um, we're hoping somebody could take, thank you, Charles. So there could be questions coming from the chat that we want to make sure that we hear. So um, we're going to really have that format for four questions. So I'm going to begin with our first question and introduce all our panelists all at once. So we're very happy first to have Ted Wright from New York City's Department of Transportation Greenway Division. Hey, Ted. Woo! And Eric Larson from New York City Parks National Natural Resource Group. Bernard Balsey from New York City's Department of Environmental Protection, in charge of the Dayline Project. John McLaughlin, also from DEP, in charge of green infrastructure for the DEP. Ashley Smith Crodiner from USGS, where are you? Leslie Wright will be represented today by Francis Rodriguez, who helped make this happen today. Thank you from the New York uh, State Office of Parks. And last but not least, first in our hearts, Rob Perani from New York, New Jersey. <laughs> Yeah. You're special, Rob. All right, so um, we're going to ask you a question, and because we do want to keep us on a schedule, um, I'm going to give our panelists 10 minutes to answer this question. And these are questions for Rob and for Ted. Okay, so the question, the topic is this. Our goal is a waterfront Harlem Greenway route from Van Cortland Park South to the South Bronx, extending the Empire State Trail to the rest of New York City and Long Island. We do have a new Greenway Lake, new waterfront parkland, and waterfront development, but not yet a Greenway. So, Ted and Rob, what options do we have for connecting the legs to the Harlem River? What has worked in other communities? And what can our Bronx community do to advance this project? So I'm gonna pass you the mic. Um, it's, thank you first of all for having us here, it's fun, it's a slightly, you know, like, I, 
I, yeah, I, I do feel a little bit like we're, uh, yeah. This is about the time slot that talk shows come on to. Uh, but, uh, right. I guess the, the real thing that I look at when I look at this effectively, um, the Harlem River and the waterfront, and how do you make a greenway out of it, uh, is in thinking about this a little bit today, I was thinking about there's really two things that really make a difference. There's number one, the connections down to the waterfront, making people feel like they can get to the waterfront. And an example, a, a bad example, but I'd like to keep it real, so to speak, is the way you come down to the waterfront here and you go through on a bike, you go through what's a garage or something. I don't even know what that thing is. It's some 1970s infrastructure mammoth. Um, but then I think about like all the stuff that we've done over the years, and Rob and I have worked for years on the Brooklyn waterfront, all the stuff that we've done in other places of the city where we've really kind of fought to have locations, uh, kind of nodes that people associate with the waterfront, makes it easier for people to get down to the waterfront. Um, I think that in, in this particular case, yes, this is nice, this is a great part, we call this a greenway, but the greenway is only so much as the whole entire stretch. So I guess the point that I'm making, the first point that I want to make, is the idea of making these connections down to the waterfront fun, graceful, inviting. It might not seem like a greenway, but that to me is like the number one thing that needs to happen. And I especially think that way along the Harlem River, that like the, the Depot Place Bridge down at the bottom of the series of parks here on the waterfront, it, it's the worst part about that is that it's the access point to the waterfront and that should be a gateway. Uh, I would tell a, a quick anecdote that on, I spent the first two years of my life at DOT working on a connection on Atlantic underneath the BQE getting to Brooklyn Bridge Park. I didn't like that at first. I wasn't what I was hired to do. I was hired to do these grand greenways and I was really excited about it. I worked with Milton Perrier who was great and was very much up and I've 14 miles of greenway, there's going to be trees all over it. And I got stuck doing an intersection project. But that said, that small intersection project creating this place that people with baby carriages all of a sudden felt invited to go to the waterfront kind of changed the dynamics along the waterfront. And I think that it's, it's hard, and this is why I'm really excited to work with DOT and Margot who's my coworker is out there and you guys should definitely talk to her and I'm really excited to talk more with all of you. But the idea here is that like some of these transportation connections we take for granted, but DOT has done a really good job of showing how these small changes, just like a traffic light, oftentimes is more valuable than miles of green paint on a road. The second real point is the miles of green paint. Um, I do think that that's important. One of the things that Mitchell and I have talked about, Mitchell works for parks a lot, is a greenway plan. It, it needs to be really, like there's lots of nuances around it. And you guys know this more. I've had lots of conversations with you guys about master planning efforts over the years and all the different plans that have gone into the waterfront. But where's the line? Where's that one line? that is now, this is a greenway. Whether or not it's long-term, short-term, what have you. What do you say to somebody like yourself? I was just talking to Joyce about it. You get on a bike and you want to go enjoy the waterfront. And if she's not coming directly here, if she's not on the Harlem line, which is basically the only way to get here, it's kind of crazy. Um, but uh, I'd never taken Metro North to where in the city. That was fun. But um, it, like the idea that you have a line on a map that stretches out and you identify it as the Harlem River Greenway, it, that's what needs to happen. And that's what I, I'm really excited about and what I think a lot of us today are excited about.
So I don't know if I answered the question, but certainly talked long enough. Well, uh, thanks, Ted, and thanks, Bob, thanks, BCEQ, for putting this all together. Um, you know, I think it, uh, to me, the fact that we're all here from various agencies and community organizations and civic groups uh, talking about the Greenway is a great, you know, testament to kind of hopefully a milestone in all the work that BCEQ has put into this uh, effort over the years. So um, I'm excited about the possibilities going forward uh, and, and all the work. And, you know, the other thing I think that uh, in looking over the program that, that everyone put together is, you know, the, you know, the, the idea that Greenways are many things, you know, it's obviously transportation, it's bike and pedestrian connections to the Harlem River as kind of first and foremost, but it can serve so many different purposes in terms of creating, um, you know, the healthy, a healthy corridor for people, healthy in terms of, um, you know, uh, getting, giving people safe places to, to bike and to walk, you know, say, you know, healthy in terms of sort of the environment. Uh, and shading that the green trees can bring and healthy in terms of, you know, improved environmental quality that maybe the Greenway can provide too through, you know, uh, stormwater treatment and other things. So I think, you know, thinking about Greenways in that holistic way, and I stole that liberally from somebody else that uh, 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 we know, um, but um, uh, so, you know, having that idea I think is really, really important. Um, let me just add to what Ted said, because I think Ted, you know, hit the nail on the head in terms of thinking about Greenway planning uh, is that idea of kind of nodes and corridors, right? And, you know, the idea that there are a series of attractions like this beautiful state park um, on the waterfront that people want to get to, that people come to all the time, that people want to have a, an easy, safe, pleasant way to get to, um, and kind of using that um, to help instill, you know, uh, uh, help, help people do that in a better way, right? Um, but at the same time, letting them know that once they get here, they can go to other destinations along the waterfront in a similarly kind of safe and pleasant way. Um, so I think it's those two goals, uh, first and foremost, in terms of the Greenway. Um, and let me just add to what Ted said by saying, you know, the other big ingredient is obviously people, right? Like it's, you know, the we're trying to build the infrastructure that'll make it safe and pleasant and give people a reason to come to the waterfront. Um, but, but ultimately, it's going to be that decision, right? It's going to be, uh, you know, somebody on a Saturday morning getting up and saying, hey, you know, what are we doing today with the kids? Let's go to the state park or let's go to Mill Pond Park or let's go to, you know, somewhere else on the Harlem River. And, you know, having a place, a way to get there that's, that invites you to walk or bicycle and not take a car or not take a train. Um, and so I think... Part of that is that safe infrastructure. And the other thing is the programming uh, that comes to it that, that makes people want to come. And so I think, you know, for our part, uh, with the Harbor and Estuary Program, uh, you know, you have a lot of great agencies here and representatives of those agencies that are going to be able to do the kind of physical infrastructure uh, and the operations that will make this thing happen. Uh, for us, I think our focus is going to be on the people side of it, um, you know, helping um, – you know, maybe providing some resources so folks can, uh, you know, have that programming like the, you know, Wilderness Inquiry event that Chauncey puts together every year, you know, that brings so many people down here. Um, but do that, you know, do more of that, right? Um, give people a, a reason to think that this is going to be their destination on that weekend or on a sunny afternoon. Um, and, um, you know, when people are doing that, you know, talking to them over these next couple of years about what they see the green way as, as accomplishing, what they see as being priorities, what they see as being the challenges, so that as the agencies go forward with the capital planning and the operational improvements, um, they can also be informed by the community. Uh, so again, I don't know if that got to your questions, Bob, but, but that's what I got. I have to apologize to everybody. I do need to leave a little early, so sorry about that. Rob, thank you. We know. So I'm going to ask uh, Chauncey and Joyce to um, have your comments on what makes a Greenway. But, as Bob said, to bring out people. I live in this community. I can pretty much tell you very few people are aware of this river and 
the high bridge and how to get to this river. They, they're not encouraged to come here. Um, I think the basics of it is really education. Somehow, we need our educational system to start to let our children know what exists out here and what can exist and allow them the, the opportunity to offer their insights into how to fix it. Kids are pretty good at coming up with ideas. And I think we cut them short shrift when we don't involve them. But when we don't have the schools that are bringing kids out on a regular basis, exposing them to the possibilities, because this is their future, the possibilities of what can be, then we really do have an uphill climb for a greenway system here in the Bronx. Sure. Um, first, I want to thank Francis and um, Monte State Park for sponsoring this event and also sponsoring the work that we've done with Wilderness Inquiry for the past 11 years. Um, it's this type of collaboration that we are working to transform the waterfront and transform folks' perspective of um, the waterfront. And I think, as Ted shared, Having a greenway can transform uh, a community, uh, but we also need to have spaces like Roberto Clemente with activities for folks to, um, to be able to access it. Um, Bridge Park is, to me, my first connection because I live in the High Bridge neighborhood, and so it's, it's the first piece where we can start seeing that we can make a high a Harlem River Greenway on the Bronx side, but it needs to be able to go somewhere. Um, and, I, and I say that because although we live in the Bronx, um, when my daughter was growing up, uh, every day on the weekend, it was a Greenway day. You know, we would get on our tandem bike, we would throw our daughter in the trailer, or throw our daughter in, in the, in the bike seat, depending on what it was, and we would bike down the Hudson River Greenway until we caught the playground on 10th Avenue, or sometimes we'd go to the playground in Hippo Park, but it was, it was a destination place that as a family, the Greenway was a safe place that we could go with our family and know that we could enjoy the weekend safely with great activities, and we knew that from May to October, if we got out early enough, we could find several locations on the Hudson River where we could always get free canoeing, right? Or free kayaking with, with one of the different programs. So it was a destination part. Uh, and then it was also when I worked in Manhattan, um, I shared this with Ted, it's about accessibility, you know, the Greenway was my way to work. It might add 15 or 20 minutes onto my trip, but the Greenway was my safest way to get down to 27th Street or to get down to City Hall for a meeting. Um, it might add more time, but I would enjoy, it would relax me, um, it would be a great return back from the day. But it's also about making sure that those spaces were open. So it's a huge step that our Bronx electeds and Manhattan elected officials came together with this administration and fought to keep the high bridge open until um, 10 o'clock now and to open early in the morning because I can say as a bicycle commuter, it was frequently that I was getting out of work at 6 o'clock and I'd be saying, can I make it? past the high bridge before it closes at seven o'clock. Because if I didn't make it to the high bridge before it closed, then it would be, am I taking the Washington Bridge? Am I taking 
the McCombs Dam Bridge, two bridges that really are not designed for pedestrian use. In fact, the, Wash the McCombs Dam Bridge, they ask you to walk your bridge across it, and the Washington Bridge, while they don't ask you to walk across it, it's three feet wide, um, and you're crossing that with pedestrians, people walking their dog, people with strollers. So it really is a revisioning of not only our greenways, but our interconnectedness to that. What are the passageways to get us to that? What are the bridges that people are gonna get? What are the neighborhoods that people get? And finally, like, what are the destination points? And I can't wait until the future comes where we're going from here to our beautiful private property now of Dynamic Star, which Dynamic Star wants to help us connect to the Putnam line, to Tibbetts, the day letting of Tibbetts Brook project. Uh, they've met with state parks already, so that's wonderful. And we can then go from here, from the High Bridge to Van Cortlandt Park, to the Empire States Trail, and then for families, that transforms families' worlds where you can say, I'm going for a weekend and going up to Yonkers with my family, and we can do it safely without the streets and the issues. So I'll pass it to Francis, because I could talk all night about greenways, as we all know. Thank you, Chauncey. Um, so I want to thank BCEQ and everyone in all the sponsors for continuing to support Wilderness Inquiry and bringing this fine group uh, to the park and to the community and to the youth and the schools. Um, it is our true heart's delight of being a co-sponsor on that and getting these youth safely on the Harlem River and teaching about waterways and safety and then so much more. I remember the first one we held 11 years ago, the federal partners and everyone. And I've been here now 18 years, so it's been a joy. I remember first meeting with BCEQ and talking about bicycle ways and green ways when we didn't allow bicycling in the park and we would chase the kids and tell them no bicycling and you pick and chose which battles but um new york state parks is great and 2017 you know they started their trails and um, we're at 720 miles of trails looking to still um, try to connect them and you're going everywhere from new york city to the hudson valley to the um up to Buffalo and we want to continue those continue making those connections I think uh, Chauncey let a little something in. we are looking to go north and seeing how we can continue those trails um, so we are looking to continue meeting with our partners and being active and getting that I remember when we uh, had to redo this park um, uh, Fortunately, due to Sandy, the park was torn apart, and we had something that we were able to then go forward through funding, and we redid the park with the thought in mind of, yes, doing bicycling and doing walkways and connecting with Bridge Park, and at the same time, um, the High Bridge Park, the High Bridge opened. I was so thrilled, and I remember the first day I saw a bicycle come across from the High Bridge into the park, and I got to ask, and I was so thrilled. Here came my first connection from Manhattan. And I was tickled about it. And I hear what you say about the connection, because I remember a meeting at Manhattan College where we met about signage. And when I first used to work at the park, there was no signage at Fordham Land and Fordham Road. No signage right over here at Tremont that led anybody to Roberto Clemente. I thought that. I said, how does anybody know where we're at? And that is one of the things people say, we are a great kept secret. So now there's signage up, thanks to a lot of these meetings and partnerships that we have. And there needs to be a continuation of that. Um, so I thank you all for this and for this format and allowing us to speak because that's what we want. We work with the schools continuously. We work with BCEQ and with a lot of these partners. So yes, let's continue to get the word out to the schools. Let's continue to work for doing the environmental education. We have a great EE team now that works throughout the city and getting the youth out and teaching them about the waterways and water quality. So I, I thank you all for the work you do because it is so important to continue our parks, um, the life and the quality that's out there. It is also important. So State Parks is there. We're there with you, and we thank you con for your continuous support. Thank you, Francis. And um, New York State Parks is a crucial link in all this um, between private property and city property. Um, in addition, I wanted to say that um, New York City has really moved mountains in the last 20 years, and in transforming the cultures of communities to become more 
recreational, uh, to use bicycle transportation for everyday commuter use, but also um, in Queens and Brooklyn now, transforming communities by access to water. So it really is a generational process and it's happening here. Um, my fellow board member, Chauncey, has been so much a part of that and bringing communities here, having places like this is a showcase and this is what it could look like. This, when you come here, this is why we're here because this is what it could be. Um, so I wanted to move on to something that we always say at Bronx Council for Environmental Equality when we are asked to advocate on behalf of the Greenways, okay? And we are a proud member of the New York City Greenway Coalition. We always put in a caveat though. Um, we support green greenways. We, we support environmentally productive greenways because we really see greenways not just for the transportation and the recreation, but for shifting the way that cities built um, to incorporate more nature, um, to build natural features into them, and to bring people closer to their natural features like water. So we this question, given now, especially in this era of resiliency planning, stormwater management crises, um, hurricanes, okay, in addition to the problems of development through the city, in which we're laying down more and more imperviousness, um, even with stormwater rules, we want our greenway, we don't want our greenways to be part of the problem, to be laying down more acres of asphalt. We want them to be green. So we had a question for our experts. How do you make greenways green? Okay, environmental protective. And I have an idea because there's one, there's a tree blooming in Brooklyn, just north of here, in Community District 8, um, and it actually does have a water feature. So there's one, but I wanted to give the mic to Merritt and talk about how to incorporate green and environmental properties into green Thank you. Um, I'm Marit Larson. I'm with the, the New York City Parks Department Natural Resources Group. Um, we we definitely at the Natural Resources Group and in the we're in the division of environmental uh, environment and planning. It's a new division, so I still um, trip on that a bit within parks. Uh, do sort of fundamentally greenways and and greening the city and and natural areas as compatible in the bigger sense. It's all part of a, a mission that uh, we have to keep our public spaces you know, sustainable and livable and, and, and high quality and and functioning both for people and for wildlife and um, and our ecosystems. But we we certainly have a risk in certain places of there being potential conflicts. So I think even you're, you mentioned uh, the Putnam Greenway and then Cortland Park is famous for, um, to some of us, uh, for having some conflict around when the, the Greenway was actually paved, when you know, when it be, when it was renovated to become functional for uh, for bicycles. So I think that's you know might as well talk about that that example. Uh, we I think we're um, as protectors and managers of that uh, forever wild park system, really sensitive to concerns about increasing fragmentation by um, expanding a greenway in the natural area. That, that's, I would say, sort of, for me, the, the one glaring area where there can be potential conflict, potential risk, uh, and need for essentially some, some compromise. Both are really important sort of systems. How do we have them work together? And in that case, um, in the, the Putnam Greenway, what we looked at was uh, was really on a on a uh, foot by foot basis, tree by tree tree basis. Um, you know the the landscape elements, the the wetland elements, the drainage. What were the sensitive components of that natural area that we had to protect um, in in order to build a greenway that was actually really functional for, for bicycles. And I'm a bike commuter, like John C. I've, you know, headed from Manhattan up to the Empire State Trail, and it is really lovely to be able to, to bike that section and not have to, you know, get off and trip and fall and get muddy. But, um, so there's so there's both the, the physical component of really looking at what the sensitive uh, species are, the sensitive areas, what we did there was, uh, was, do small modifications in the alignment, 
did uh, we kept the greenway as, as narrow as we safely could where it was where it made sense we um, looked at um, and in this greenway in particular we were kind of coming in at the tail end of the designs but we were able to incorporate some short sections of boardwalk to uh, avoid um, tree root impacts in particular for some of the largest trees and to try to uh, facilitate flow conveyance from an upslope side to, to a wetland in the downslope. So that, those are elements that we use there. I think in, in other sections we're about to embark on the design and construction of a greenway system in Casino Park in um, Queens and we're similarly going to be looking at all those issues. Uh, since we're going to be uh, designing it in-house from the start, it was a consultant designer at the Putnam Trail. Initially, we're going to be looking at a wider array of tools. We're going to be looking at permeable pavement, perme um, permeable asphalt and concrete in sections. We'll be looking at boardwalk. We'll be looking at structural soils. We'll be looking at where we can have sheet flow into vegetative uh, rain gardens and swales where it simply accepts that water. We'll be looking at if there's any opportunities for subsurface storage and we're certainly going to be looking at um, the adjacent planting. So in general I would just say about uh, greenways that in the urban area um, in order to make them green with vegetation you know you need sufficient space and then you, um, if you have the space you need soil and you need you know the right height water uh, and you need to select vegetation that works well and then you need care you actually need maintenance so not just maintenance of the greenway uh, but maintenance of the adjacent vegetation and the trees eventually. So all of those things play back. Aaron, thank you. And um, I just wonder if Greenway planners are realizing that there's um, unique design challenges when you're building next to water bodies, right, which you're talking about, but also introducing water bodies into a Greenway system. Um, in a lot of ways, what DEP is, is doing up north here is for actually introducing a natural feature that is a, a, a stream. Um, but John or Pinar, do you want to talk about how what your design innovations are that introduce that make make greenways environmentally productive? Right. Thank you. I just want to also say thank you to BC EQ for inviting us today and the other panelists on the up here. Um, we the current theme I've heard about green waste, just as before going into the DP portion, is there people transportation corridors that are safe to get from point A to point B, and having a natural feature as part of that greenway, such as the Harlem River, makes it all that more important. Um, but it, you know, to build upon what Robert was saying, a greenway is green in a couple of ways. I mean, you know, it could be green in its building, that's sustainable, that it's using green products and also green from an ecological perspective I mean, that's where I come from the the in, in designing it it does need to have the proper plant selection I mean, uh, I've designed many large-scale restorations in the city over the past 30 years at DEP and in choosing the right material choosing the right soil is, is key and also choosing those species that are not so common that it's for us aesthetically to look at, it's very nice, but we also need to think of wildlife and such as pollinators. So the Greenway is also a people transportation corridor, but it's also a pollinator corridor along the way. Uh, and for the, you know, for the Tibbetts portion, it's, it's finding those locations that have enough space that one can accommodate both the transportation corridor and leave room for green um, and not you know, in the, in the, so much in the Tibbet case, but in Greenways, is designing them to handle, you know, extreme situations. To at least that it's, you know, it's not damaged when it's over. You know, that it's it's built to handle some of that flooding, that it can, you know, a little uh, cleaning up or a little repair is done afterwards, but it should be designed in such a way as to handle or, you know, to be able to buffer some of those extreme events. Um, and I don't want to take too much from Pinar, but uh, yeah. but yeah, it's just you know, it's it's just building it that it's it has enough buffer capacity. We always, I just want to say we we always advocate for like a permanent SWIP, 
stormwater prevent prevention plan, not just during construction, but it should really mitigate those impacts. Um, Ted, I just wanted to ask you, is this a new generation, new challenges for you at DOT in incorporating green features into your Greenway plan? Sure, it's new. It, I think that the city is definitely getting, like if I was just having an informational interview the other day with somebody and I told her that water is, if you want to get into a field that's you're going to have jobs and where the federal money is going, water is probably a good way to go about it. Um, like if you are into that side of urban planning, you're probably due for some good jobs. That said, I, I think that the city still has real challenges on this kind of stuff. And like as much as my DEP counterparts do this stuff every day, I think that there's like, as we're looking at a greenway, I think we need to remain very positive at all aspects and not in the, like just to come at it really strongly is like the idea of do we want to deal with everything here do we want to make sure that there's trees do we want to make sure that there's stormwater prevention do we want everything or do we want to start somewhere you don't want to let perfect be the enemy of good and like from what i'm proud of and what i think makes a big difference and i definitely am up for conversations with everybody here about this and always do as a matter of fact we have conversations um we need to plant the flag dot does a really good job of planting the flag getting the job started like creating the space we talked about widths you know we're talking about areas that aren't van Cortland park van Cortland park dates back to god knows how long you know like before all of us 18th century yeah like that's crazy it was like a riot they were probably fox hunting and stuff in it but like um with red coats on yeah god anyway i think that like the key here on something like this is getting the flags out there and i think dot needs to we need to be really clear that like tibbets was talked about for years you talked about that decades i've been hearing about it and literally john matera would come to me and say, whoa, well, what is Parks gonna do down, like 10 years ago, I was like, Parks isn't gonna do nothing. There's a, there's a corridor down there, ain't nothing gonna happen down there, they've been talking about it, are there still trains down there? I don't, sorry, I'm like kind of, uh, right, no, no, but like, what it takes though, is to say, okay, like, this is gonna be a greenway, and then you get, Pinar has like amazing selling points on what's going on at Tibbetts, Tibbetts that like, I don't even want, Right, you sell those, you sell that, and then you create it into a greenway, and then you got something. And now we're talking about this area here, connected to that area, connected to the Empire State Trail. Like, we, we, solve, we also need to solve this Putnam Tibbets thing. We gotta come up with one name. There's marketing, <laughs> marketing aspects are a problem here. <laughs> uh, we got to what are the kids gonna call it? Yeah, I like that. All right, sorry, I'm giving up the mic. I gotta go very soon, I'm sorry. Ted, really, thank you. And just to let you know our ulterior motive here, there's like $150 million worth of city funds going here. We're planting the flag here. And what we're doing here is doing what you just said, using one agency, in this case, lion's share of the budget coming from DP. Parks, NRG working alongside to plant the flag and start a new role of greenway planning so that's where we plus a little thing called a raised grain is not a bad idea either we'll talk about that later um i do have something to ask dot at the end what are you excited about if you could just tell your colleague in our lightning round on your way out i know you're gonna go now yeah all right yeah <laughs> I honestly, from like an excitement standpoint, I'm sorry, I'm going to yeah, jump yeah, again. Yeah, go. Margo's going to help here, and Margo's going to come you, up. But what I'm most excited about is actually we've hired Margo. We're hiring more people. We just got a huge... We got a huge raise grant for planning monies that 7.25 million, I don't know, over seven, it's a lot. And that's just for planning. So when you talk about planning a flag and coming up with a line, that's what I'm excited about. And I'm excited that Margot can be 
a smart person that really cares about this stuff and we start to build the next generation. So. Right with you. And I want to turn the mic over to Karen Genty. Put on. Does Karen need an introduction? No, but she needs our, a big hand. Yay, Karen. Hey, everybody. I, I think what John said was great. I would just like to add that the whole idea of a greenway, when you look it up online in the rest of the world, not the New York City world, but the whole rest of the world, it starts out as an environmental project. It's the first thing that happens. And not only that, that would be nice, but it's more than nice. We need that environmental project. If we're going to have a place for the young people to live, in this city, we need to have that 100 miles of greenway that was designed in 1993 to be absorbent, to put the rain into the ground so that it goes into the water bodies the way that nature did. And because we're so built out, we need to make that a big effort. That's beautiful, Karen. Thank you. Um, we have one more question for our great panel. Um, we are here to think together and get agencies to think together and borrow everybody's cus custody of the environment, which is paramount right now. We have a last question because greenways are built along waterways and they're built into watersheds. So we asked about how do you make a greenway green. Our last question is really why do you make a greenway green? What is the environmental, good environmental impact of greenway building? And how do you think they can help us deal with our water problems of today, everything from climate change to stormwater to flooding along major highways here in the Bronx, Bronx River and um, uh, the Major Deegan, both at the end of huge watersheds. So I just wanted to give this to Ashley from USGS um, and uh, Pinar Belsey and John from DP to talk about some of the good impacts of building a green green. Depending on the design, um, I guess what you're putting in there, you can try and slow the water down. Um, so I guess the flow of the water, if it rains, is all of that water just going along the, I guess, non-porous pavement? Or are we going to input um, porous pavement, help, help slow it down, or um, and just divert the water um, to another area? Um, are we going to uh, stop it from um, just going directly into our, our sewers at a fast rate, so slowing down the rate um, is going to help reduce CSO events, you know, which is pretty much just raw sewage going into our waterways, which Harlem River definitely has that as um, one of its uh, issues. Um, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see what else. I can think of anything else. Um, um, depending on the plants that are chosen um, to be, I guess, I guess say installed or, or put in the greenway, um, they can help filter out certain pollutants that are um, carried in any runoff. Uh, you know, that's that's going over the surface, um, and uh, any of that um, runoff that was previously full of pollutants. Um, going into our water, obviously it'll be reduced. It'll help um, with our water quality, um, among other things. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I think the question was how to make the greenway green, and the answer is the perfect marriage. So how we did it with Tibbetts, you know, we find the right partner, the Parks Department. I, um, I call it the perfect marriage because it doesn't matter who's bringing what, we really leverage the resources, um, the funding, and the space. And although we fight on a daily basis, we love each other, and we are going to make it work. By end of next year, we are going to have a design completed and kick off the construction 2025. I am going to send those dates um, until... A, bigger power than me 
changes it. But, you know, I think where we find uh, um, opportunities among the agencies and really bringing what Karen is saying, that stormwater resiliency in the Greenway. I mean, I'm going to talk about my dream of Greenways, right? Everybody said transformation of communities, access to the waterways, um, you know, public um, opportunities. My dream is different. <laughs> my dream is how can we make these Greenways resilient for the future? Not for next generation, not Chauncey's kids, but the generations the following, how are we going to really make and design the greenways different. Do we have to have the bike paths? It's great. Can we drop them to some level that is going to, you know, create some storage? Can we design our streets with the crowns reversed? So it's not going to the, you know, adjacent to the curb. It's actually keeping it in the midst of the street that the street is becoming an augmentation to our existing sewer infrastructure. Can we build the curbs to seven inch or eight inch or nine inch? Can we? Is everybody gonna okay with that? Can we build our bike lanes, not painting them green, but building them porous and 10 feet storage underneath them? So, you know, could it be done? If I talk to Ted, now I can't say anything after him. He's not here. He rolls his eyes and he's like, really, start small. But I'm like, why, why not bring, start big, right? So I'm going to ask this group, what is the impervious acres in New York City? Anybody make a guess? Impervious acres in the city. No, I'm, to, I'm asking a number. A number, the impervious acreage in the city. Do not cheat. No Googling. Yeah, what is, what is that equal to? It's more than 130,000. So think about that. Like a, we are seeing an inch increase in the rainfall every 10 years in the city. The projections, it's going to go up 11% more. Our imperviousness is not changing. You are not removing your backyard and putting it green, are you? I don't see anyone in my neighborhood. So I think, you know, what we really need to do is we have to t rethink our design. And I think that's what you're asking, Bob. How can we bring that different design into this vision? Whether you are visioning transforming the community, whether opening the access to the open, you know, the waterways, we have to rethink those streets, not just put a bike lane in it, but redesign the streets. Maybe pick the areas where we are the most vulnerable, but that's where my dream is. You know, really working with you all, the Parks Department, Sarah Nielsen, the Greenway leaders, and Ted, and our stakeholders and can we really make some of these changes and it piloted just to show the world new york city can lead in this front and we need to need your support right up to your the letters and you know in terms of push us in that new thinking in the design so that's all I'm not sure I can add anything to that. <laughs> um, so I'll just say I concur, but can't add to that. Um, Fanar, thank you so much for that vision. And it really, I really think that Natural Resource Group should have the entire city to think about as it's designed because we need more natural features in our city for the challenges that are facing us right now. And Fanar, we really do look at this as a, a, a force change in urban ecology because of climate change. And we can build some features here and there, but we need a commitment from everybody to really learn from what you're doing with parks and DOT and um, DPR in, um, in the Tibbetts project. And my dream is to go upstream from there and build cooperation with the states, county and state 
from which we get our water so that we can actually have a regional approach to stormwater management uh, because the water doesn't really stop where the city maps are. It becomes gravity fed from way upstream. Now, Chauncey, we got some questions from the chat. So, yep. are they, you want to take it? Sure. So, Michael Johnson, uh, who's a board member of BCQ and also co-founder of South Bronx Unite, uh, wants to bring our attention uh, to the south, south of the Bronx. And he asks um, that, you know, we need a connected greenway to the south, south Bronx, where the belly of environmental justice beast lives. The plan is in place and it has a name, the Monhaven Port Morris Waterfront Plan. What do the panelists believe um, about this and do they believe that it is needed? The M Mount Haven uh, Port Morris Waterfront Plan. And anyone want to jump on that? I was going to turn it to my colleague Mitchell in case he knows that um, plan well, but I would just say, yeah, it's needed. And um, it's, it's pretty hard to bike up through the South Bronx if I do it, and it's difficult. So I don't know, if, Mitchell, if you know that area. Um, yeah, it's, it doesn't have a lot of parkland. It's got a lot of um, de you know, development, some sections of which will become accessible, and those should have greenways. So. I mean, one thing I'll mention just to respond to that, folks might, might not be aware that that is most of that waterfront is state-owned property. So um, all of the property that um, Fresh Direct is on, what the New York Post was on, um, what the FedEx uh, property is on is all a property that's called the... Um, Harlem River Yards, and that is owned uh, and operated by the Gillespie Group um, with a 100-year or 99-year lease to the state of New York. And it was designed as a intermodal transportation system. So it is, it, the vision for that property was we would have rail lines coming into the South Bronx to stop truck traffic. Um, coming into the South Bronx and in the city. What happened, unfortunately, is the Oak Point line was planned in the 70s and 80s and was built in the early 2000s. Um, and by the time it was built, it was completely obsolete. So it was envisioned as all of our, all of our food, of our distribution would be brought down that train line, but now the industry standard is a double stacked train car. So you've seen them in New Jersey, you've seen them in other states, um, and the train companies are not going to decouple and, and you know make a single stack of car lines. So unfortunately, that train line is used for one use only these days, and it is you know we nickname it the garbage train. Um, but it's what's bringing trash out of the Bronx, and we take a majority of trash, um, the largest percentage of trash travels up that rail line, um, and it's only done at night. If we were here at 9 o'clock at night, we might see the train go by, um, and you definitely smell the train when it goes by, um, but it also is one of our largest uh, problems when we're looking at revisioning and envisioning the Greenway because from my neighborhood in Highbridge, the Highbridge yards all the way down to the Harlem River yards, 1.9 miles, there is the most expensive train project in, in U.S. history, at least at the time that it was built. I don't know if one of these ultra-fast lines is going to subdue it because 1.9 miles is built on the water itself. So even the waterfront parks that we recently opened, Mill Pond Park in 2009, the 145th Street Park, all these properties um, going into the area that South Bronx United is advocating for and that we're advocating for for the Greenway, all of those are, even though you're building waterfront parks, you can't actually get to the water because 
while we envisioned Mill Pond Park with kayaks and canoes going on it, when we actually brought our kayak for the first trip, Park said, we know that it was in the visioning plan, but now that we've seen the high tides and the high tide on the Harlem River, you might not realize it's over five feet, right? It's five point, five and a half feet high tide, low tide difference. So you could get out on a kayak and canoe on low tide underneath the Oak Point line, high tide comes, you're stuck on the other side. So that is the issue. So Roberto Clemente State Park is one of the few parcels where we can get out there. Lincoln Avenue um, in the South Bronx is another location where you can get past it. Here at, underneath the high bridge, we have a natural beach where you could do a uh, boathouse, but this is the complication. Um, and it's why we want our city planners to think bigger, because as we said, that was built in 2001. They took our waterfront away from us, two miles of waterfront. And the High Bridge car washing location, which is just south of the High Bridge, was built in 2004, 2005. And that took acres of waterfront now that we're trying to figure out how to develop a greenway, how to take access back from our public utilities. So these are the issues that we need to be thinking about in the long-term planning and what Michael's bringing up with the plan. Michael's couldn't be here today. Um, he's doing amazing work and had um, full-time advocating for a new institution down in his community. But uh, I also wanted to bring up that you've seen the big developments along the, um, um, the Major Deacon and the Bruckner Boulevard, and they were zoned without greenways, so um, without a link between the greenways. So the developers are making those connections themselves, but one of the biggest problems is that all that private real estate is now being developed with kind of porches in front, boardwalks for their properties rather than a continuous greenway. So. Um, Michael and VCQ are fighting for connectivity between them. So, um, do you want to say any more, any more questions from our audience? Um, I wanted to end our little conference with some great news. And this is going to begin our lightning round. So, um, please jump in with your good news, um, because a lot is happening. So, you've heard about the Inflation Reduction Act okay which brings a lot of money for environmental sustainability you've heard about the federal infrastructure bill that is bringing lots of money to our area um, there is also we mentioned before the new york city's share of the federal raise grant which is designed to fill in gaps between greenways and within the boroughs. There is an Environmental Bond Act that will bring money to environmental construction. There is the Renewable Energy Community Investment Funds. So there's a lot of new resources in addition to those big capital projects that we talked about. So this is a lightning round for everybody here from Joyce to Merritt. So Merritt, I'm gonna start with you. What, and just pass the mic, what are you most excited about that's happening right now? Well, I'd have to say I'm most excited about the projects that we are, are laboriously working on um, that are on the waterfront. So we are designing um, Bridge Park South, um, working again with my colleague to, uh, Mitchell in the planning of greenways on the Manhattan side. I mean, obviously Tibbetts Brook and looking towards some of the other waterfront projects in the South Bronx, Barreto Point, um, the continued work that partners are doing across the, the way at Sherman Creek. So I, I have to say I'm, I love the big vision projects, cloudburst across the city um, that we're working on with DEP. That's very exciting to me. And, um, I kind of get into the details of the projects we're doing now and trying to see them into fruition. So, um, um, I'm excited that there's more funding being put into environmental water quality. Um, USGS has a lot more um, gauges, monitoring gauges being put around the city. 
we have Ryland Park, um, the Oyster Bay. Um, there's more funding for the um, Bronx River Gauge, um, a, a bunch of other projects that we're looking at. I'm also glad to be here with all of you, kind of you know going back and forth and hearing what you guys um, think and and the I guess the process of thinking about these things. Um, yeah, that's that's it so far. Yeah, um, I'm very excited about um, coming to this new party, <laughs> to the Greenway group, honestly. You know, we, we, I haven't worked on Greenways up until Tibbetts Project came in. Um, as I said, we are the most recent additions to this group. Um, so we are very excited to starting finishing Tibbetts, um, cloth burst management, which we call it the Green Infrastructure 2.0. Uh, which we would like to start implementing that in New York City by changing the the way the streets are going to look, the, the way the bike lanes are going to look, the way we are going to redesign these um, basketball and tennis courts below ground, and, you know, really bring this resiliency to the New York City. Um, and I'm really excited about to work with our stakeholders, you know, we can't do anything without their support. So, you know, I'm, I'm really looking to create this uh, resilient New York City for the next century and um, envision it together. So, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Karen, and everyone for having us today. Thank you. It's not quite related to here, but personally excited of the research we're doing using natural systems and if Paul Mankowitz were here he'd, be, he'd probably give a big shout out is we're looking at rib mussels and tidal wetlands to improve water quality. Freshwater wetlands have been studied extensively for their water quality benefits but tidal wetlands not so much and the reason for that is it moves in up down sideways and you know not a freshwater system that flows in one direction um, and then rib mussels um, because they feed on such small particles, they're very good at removing pathogens uh, from the water column. Other locales have looked at this, you know, Chesapeake Bay, Narragansett Bay, other locales, and we're currently doing research with Cornell and Stony Brook uh, to advance that. So it applies here in the Harlem River as well, trolling wetlands and rib mussels to improve water quality. Well, I'm excited about the fact that I have discovered that the Bronx has not received its fair share of funding in every single category that you could think of. And so to make up for that, I'm not even saying that we should like get excited about that. We just need to make up for that. So if the fair share for all the other counties is 20%, we get 40. They're actually going to get less because if you balance it out, we get that 40. So I'm asking for double whatever any other county gets so that we can have our fair share. It'll take us probably about 10 years to catch up to the rest of the city, but that's what I'm excited about. And the first thing is the Bond Act, because I understand that 35% of 30 or 40% of the Bond Act money has to be spent in disadvantaged uh, areas. Now, I'm not saying we're all disadvantaged, but we're pretty disadvantaged in this county. And we need, and that's why we're at the bottom. We need a lot of help here. And so I'm really excited about that part. Well, I'm excited for where we're at, where we've come from, um, for all the funding we have received. Uh, as towards capital projects, we just submitted additional items onto our capital projects, which does get reviewed every year. Uh, as towards the tidal pools and the littoral zone, we understand. We understand the studies of the plantings. We've been through it. We have the new manuals, and we go through all that. And I'm grateful for, again, where we are at. Um, looking forward for next year. This is your first urban state park that ever was. We are getting ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary. So I am very excited for that. I'm excited to hopefully have BCEQ next, next year back with us with Wilderness Inquiry to see what else will come down our way. Um, we're going to be completing a few more projects which will allow us to have additional programming for the youth, having a beautiful um, upstairs entry and some additional program spacing 
and um, hopefully to see what will be coming to the south and hopefully the north of the park. So I am excited for all that. Okay, um, I'm excited about the RAISE grant, um, which is really going to help DOT start planning uh, the Harlem River Greenway um, as part of uh, the New York City Greenway planning that's going to happen, that we're finally included because, as Francis shared, this is the 50th anniversary of Roberto Clemente State Park. This is also the 30th anniversary of the Bronx Greenway plan. Uh, and this Harlem River Greenway, where we're standing on right now, right, this is the path of the Greenway, which will some way go up to Ben Cortland Park and someday go down to Randless Island. Um, that was included in that plan, as was Tibbetts Brook. So the daylighting of Tibbetts Brook and the Putnam Greenway plan is also a dream uh, decades in the making and all these things are starting to come to fruition. So I'm excited that we have parks, DEP, USGS, New York State Parks, um, DOT, all in the room together, um, talking and collaborating together. Because as we all know, this is a huge city, and sometimes these agencies, and as much as they might be partners with us, don't always talk in the same room on the same project. So I think this is exciting that we are all starting to work together. Ashley is sitting here, and I have not acknowledged her. Ashley comes every week with USGS. She is out on that pier. She pulls the water test qualities and the tubes and everything. We have our own web page on there that shows what this, what the Harlem River water quality is. And we just want to thank her for being out there. The kids see, everyone sees, and she has been just faithful weather, no matter what, to come out to this park and doing that. We're grateful to USGS for going out. They get the grant. They get the um, all the equipment, the sonic. They get all the stuff, and then they come out and put it out there with their team, and then they are faithful in coming out and taking care. So if they reach out to you and tell you, hey, can we do this in your park? We'll get the grant and monitor it. Go with it. They are an awesome team, and she does the work faithfully no matter what. So big applause to them and their team. And they do. They, they, they will tell you what is going on in that water and the water quality, which helps us so much. Well, I'm very excited about the announcements of all of this monies that are coming. What I would like to see is a line-by-line -line accountability of how these monies are being spent. Uh, typically, monies go out into the ether, and you don't know what happened to it. So that's what I'm excited about. Can I say one more thing? I also just want to say that we have, um, it's exciting that we actually have a local water and air and flood monitoring company right here in the South Bronx, and we actually have the uh, CEO of the company, Brian Wilson from Dora, uh, who's here, here. So something we ran into, Brian, on our Greenway tour with, uh, with DOT this past week, and I had no idea that we had a water, air, and flood monitoring company uh, based in the South Bronx. So just a resource that uh, we have and we weren't aware of. So I'm excited about that. Just wanted to shout that out. Definitely. Um, I'm excited about making this new collaboration between NRG, DOT, and DEP a real game changer for how we design our parks, how we manage our water, and how we build our greenways. So I really want to scale that and make that a city, a national model, frankly, uh, for how to build the next generation. I'm also really excited about going north, working with the county, with the state, um, on watershed management and bringing in DOT, state DOT, to talk about how to make the Greenway the uh, Major Deegan resilient. And I'm really excited, John, about my trip to Shirley Chisholm State Park. So I, I really want to see that. Um, Brian, so we wanted to, we're, that is the end of our program, but um, we wanted to take questions from our studio audience. And Brian, I know you had a question. Do you want to come up here and take the mic? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, really happy to be here. 
Brian Wilson, as you mentioned, uh, we're a small business located in Mod Haven. Our office is right on the Harlem River. We make IoT environmental monitoring devices, and we also have a sister company called Dura Workforce, where we try to inspire young people to get interested in jobs related, whether it's data science, manufacturing or devices, and going on the field. So my question is, how does a small business we weren't known of recently get involved with these projects so that we can be a part of all these amazing things? Yeah, there's a lot of money, and do right now we have the kind of funding infrastructure for how these grants are going to be distributed, what projects are going to be privileged, that kind of thing. Is that a work in progress right now, everybody? Um, anybody? Want to take a well, I can't speak really intelligently about it, but you know, there are when contracts go out, you know, it's I would say hook up with a larger general contractor who's bidding on the work and you know, explain what your qualifications are and what you can do. And that's one way to get your foot in the door. I mean, there's no, it has to be through competitive bidding, so we can't say pick you, but I would just suggest reaching out to those larger folks that typically get contracts and you know, see if you can get a foot in the door with them. That's what I thought. So the cannabis bill is, was created with small business first time involved. Um, and John, that's an issue that we've seen. Um, how do you get a small business? They have to join forces with a large business. There's a huge amount of money coming in from especially renewable energy companies. How does everybody profit from that? Any ideas? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I'm not into the procurement world, um, but what I learned over the last 10 years, if you're a small business, um, it's advantageous if you are a minority-owned small business. The city has to give a percent of the contracts to the minority-owned companies, so that's one aspect of it. Um, the second is, you know, you, you need to register for the city, and there's a lot of paperwork that you have to go through. So, you know, even uh, I get this question, um, you know, I just started my business, how can I get a contract? And then the answer is, you know, you, you need to really first register, become the registered entity or provider to the city before you can even become eligible to be done any contracts, whether big or small. And then the third is, um, check the LL63. So we, the city publishes all the procurements, including the bids, the design, the professional services, whatever we have to bid out, that's not a secret. Um, we publish that under LL63. So Google it, you'll find that list, and then check if anything that interests you, then um, you know, try to put paperwork. We do publish you know, what that amount would be, and when it um, is expected to be released. Hope it helps. Well, I think that ends our conference for today. So this was our first hybrid, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. We hope this was helpful and fun.
So your physical science yeah. is yeah. 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 This is a perfect place. Plus, I would love to see more sounds of you, too. Great. You'll let us know. I Thank <laughs> you. 